you radiated yourself. Yes. Like, explain that. As far as I know, <laughs> I'm the only person that's like deliberately dosed themselves with ultraviolet light and then Narcan themselves to, to see if it would trigger an opioid response. And it did. I still felt terrible for like eight to 12 hours. Oh, wow. Former NIH scientists have looked into this that UV light does affect the opioid receptors in the brain in a pretty consistent way. When you have ultraviolet light, it's having effects on the body. One, it's it's replenishing your vitamin D levels. The second thing it's, it's doing over time is it's populating a little bit of a human's opioid receptors, very similar to heroin, morphine, fentanyl, Vicodin, and yeah. skin cancer is a serious thing, and skin cancer is caused by overexposure to the sun, specifically ultraviolet radiation causes a lot of skin cancer. The sunblocks are tricky because a lot of the sunblocks, when you dig down into their active ingredients, they tend to block, so there's ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. And they're two different wavelengths and they do slightly different things. So a lot of the suntan lotions or blocks you put on are kind of harmful in the sense that you put them on and you go to the beach on their mind, think, oh, I'll go outside, maybe I'll put on some sunblock, it'll be good for me, I'm gonna get my vitamin D. And eh, you're actually not getting your vitamin D. Yeah. That sunblock's blocking your vitamin D synthesis. Alistair, Alec, welcome, ben. welcome to Miami and welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I was just, here? yeah, I was just telling you, Ada, who's my social media manager, shout out to you, Ada. You put, oh, she put you on my radar. Uh, I hadn't heard about your YouTube channel, which is Boss to Wiki. Yeah. Fantastic channel. We'll talk about that. Thank you. She sent me this video of yours about a couple months ago. She's like, you got to check out this guy's YouTube channel and you got to check out this specific video. It's a documentary that you did because you had, and I want you to explain it. This yeah. is really wild, by the way, and everybody, you're gonna want to watch the full documentary. We'll reference it down below. One of the most fascinating experiments I've seen, I actually rewatched it today to prepare for the interview, but you explained, you had an idea, you had an hypothesis, and what did you end up doing, Alec? The hypothesis was based on a few research papers I had uncovered and then spoke to the doctor up at Mass General, who was doing the research on UV light and its effects on the opioid receptors in the brains. And a lot of the research had been done with mice, but theoretically, after speaking to them, it applies to humans. And there had been anecdotal evidence that UV light affects the opioid receptors in mice to humans to most brains. And so I radiated myself quite aggressively <laughs> with UV light. And then I took Narcan, which is you know, the drug naltrexone or naloxone oh, but before is, you before you yeah. ra you radiated yourself yes. like explain that yeah <laughs> so I, I i very methodically went about dosing myself with with a lot of uv for any viewers reference i live in new york city not exactly the most sunny place so i, I went out and deliberately exposed myself to two hours of sun every day during the summer and then on top of that would go to a tanning bed and just tan myself vigorously to expose myself to as much UV light as I could. And you went out during a between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Yeah, which is the, the, the highest UV index, yeah. right? So I figured out when the, the like the UV index, like, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, it's something like 1 to 10. Or there's an index 1 to 12, I think is the index. I think it's 1 to 12, yeah. 1 yeah. to 12. <laughs> My memory is failing me here. The So I went during the highest possible time, did it for about three months, and on top of that, I would go to the tanning bed, just just radiate my body with UV light. And at the end of it, around 90 days, I took Narcan and just nasal injected myself with Narcan to see if I could to see if I could trigger a opioid withdrawal response. Because that's what Narcan is used yeah, for. Yeah, Narcan is used for medically when there's an opioid overdose, overdose, fentanyl or heroin, you see somebody on the street and the EMTs respond. Yeah. They generally are, are administering Narcan immediately to try to revive the patient, and Narcan is very effective at that. Yeah. So, so if you're watching like uh, Ozarks or one of yeah. those movies, and somebody's overdosing on um, heroin, yeah, you see them get injected with Narcan, Narcons, and uh, boom, they're yeah waking up and they're you know they're spitting all over themselves. Yeah, it, it Narcan basically rips the whatever's binding to the opioid receptors in one's brain. It rips them off really fast and, and causes not only if they're not breathing the respiratory you know, allow them to breathe, but it'll put them in withdrawal as yeah. well. It just, you know, it, gone. And so therefore, given given if Narcan works on normal opioid usage, and if there's a correlation between UV light and a, an opioid effect in the brain, Narcan should have the same effect. So I UV'd my body up, took the Narcan, and it put me right into full withdrawal, very uncomfortable. 
<laughs> wrote it out, but it, it proved to, to at least my satisfaction that indeed the research that's being done up over in Harvard and then some some other former NIH scientists have have looked into this that UV light does affect the, the opioid receptors in the brain in, in a pretty consistent way. Okay, so that video of you taking the Narcans, is that how you say it properly? I always feel like I butcher that. Narcans? Narcan. Singular. Narcan. Yeah, I, Narcan. I've been saying plural. Narcan. You're there, I think, four minutes in after you did the nasal spray, and you're like, I, oh, I'm noticing my legs. Uh, I, yeah. I'm starting to sweat. Explain that. What were you feeling? Yeah, so I, I was a little gung-ho about it. I, I'm not an abuser or user of opioids, so I didn't really know what to expect. I, I had spoken to a few physicians, and, and they said, yeah, you know, it's a pretty common application to people that are overdosing on opioids opioids should be relatively safe it, you might feel withdrawal symptoms i didn't know really what to expect and it's a it's a standard nasal spray like imagine taking your allergy medication yeah. you know type of deal so i i give it a go and you feel the little nasal drip and i didn't feel anything at first for the first couple minutes i thought oh this is a bust and then slowly it just started to creep up on me and the first thing i noticed was the legs it, hard to articulate they just felt very, very, very painful. I, I like they locked up, and then my eyes started to water. I was yawning constantly, and it just went all downhill from there. Got very nauseous, full sweat, heartbeat went through the roof. Mm. Not, not great. But it took, I don't know, a good five to ten minutes for it to really take an effect. And how did it? La how long did it last overall? You ended up puking. Oh and yeah, so. Uh, 30 minutes into it, I was, I was dope sick equivalent of like felt, I, I sympathize with people that are in withdrawal. I'll say that mm -hmm. it was not pleasant. And then I had spoken ahead of time to some, some doctors. So I was like, I think I'm doing this. I'm like, yeah, it'll be all right. That, oh, you know, it's going to reduce your dopamine levels. When you take Narcan, it's going to rip off your dopamine levels, your serotonin levels, your endorphins, like a way to counter counteract that a little bit is if you're able to, you know, get your, get your heart rate up, get you running something to get your endorphins kind of back. Mm. So I just went and started trying to run, but I still felt terrible for like eight to 12 hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. is when I, by the 12 hour mark, I felt basically normal. But All for the sake of journalism. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> I love it. As far as I know, <laughs> I'm the only person that's like deliberately dosed themselves with ultraviolet light and then narcan themselves to, to see if it would trigger an opioid response and it and did this is really important because let's talk about yeah. opi opioid addiction yeah and how it's become so prevalent i mean there have been wars in the past based off of opioids yeah china and china UK, and, and, and like, britain yeah. right yeah yeah Ada sent me a whole bunch of info i have here i'm like oh my gosh this is this is fascinating so Share a little bit more about, you know, the prevalence of opioid addiction out there. And then you also made a strong correlation between that happening in those states that lack sunshine versus those that have more sunshine. Yeah. So there's, you can go down, you know, the internet's great for going down rabbit holes. For sure. But <laughs> th this is actually a pretty scientific, you know, reasonable rabbit hole. The more I talk to MD, PhDs, they were kind of researching into the the epidemiology of what's going on here. Because if, you, if we step back and we think about ultraviolet lights and sunlight and opioids and mood just in general, what initially led me on this hypothesis is I was paying attention to SAD, like seasonal affective disorder. In if your viewers are in the Midwest or in Seattle or Alaska, People have seasonal affect disorder. Yeah. And I was reading, there was a comment that caught my eye. And the comment was, seasonal affect disorder seems to correlate more with visible light being readily available in the mornings and not to do with melanocytes converting to mu opioids. And I was like, huh? And that's what initially led me to start digging deeper. When was this? What year? Oh, this is 2020? 2020. You know, I was, uh, a lot of free time. Yeah. COVID is sitting there reading published research papers in New York City. <laughs> my kind of style. My yeah, kind right? of style. <laughs> and, and so the, the evidence had indicated that seasonal affect disorder, 
really the best cure for seasonal affect disorder, from my understanding, is just getting visible sunlight in, in the eyes in the morning. Visible sunlight. You'll be able to see this, the sky outside, and it just improves the mood. But that, that side comment, which is like, it doesn't have to do with melanocytes being translated into opioids. I was like, well, wait, I've never heard of this. What is this? So separate from seasonal affect disorder that has to do with visible light that you see in the morning, there's something else going on, that which, which you don't see, ultraviolet light, which is also coming from the sun, but you know, it's a different frequency. So it's not visible light. And so independent of, of visible light, the sunlight, when you have ultraviolet light, it's having effects on the body. One, it's, it's replenishing your vitamin D levels, which have a variety of health benefits. The second thing it's, it's doing over time is it's populating, for lack of better words, a little bit of a human's opioid receptors, very similar to heroin, morphine, fentanyl, Vicodin. It's not a strong response, but it, it's, it's subtle. And over time, that's why, again, there's been studies, if, you, if you're in the sun for a long day, you'll kind of feel tired, you'll kind of feel maybe reinvigorated. So you're getting a little bit of an opioid stimulation, a little bit of a, a narcotic feeling from that UV light, you know, a day at the beach. And why people sometimes really like tanning beds because mm -hmm. they get that that opioid effect. What is that term you used in your documentary where you're addicted to sunbathing and sun tanning? Oh, hemo! Oh my gosh, heliophilia. That's what it was. Yes, Helio heliophilia. There's yeah. a, there's a, a Latin term for you know, addicted to the sun. That happened to you, didn't you say? Yes. That? Yeah. yeah. It, it's once I I started. I'll back up and say so the seasonal affect disorder. I was like, okay, fair enough. This UV light thing is interesting. Let me explore that farther. And I had spoken to Dr. Fisher, who was working at Mass General and doing research on mice. He was radiating mice and, and showing they had a response and were starting to like the UV light. They would choose it like you would choose cocaine or any other drug. They had some sort of addictive response to it. I thought, oh, well, let me just start exposing myself to sun at a higher dose than I normally would living in New York City at a certain latitude in the line. And after couple weeks i liked it and when i didn't go out i'd be, I'd be moody mm. i want to go get the sun i want to you know sit there and feel it and it's subtle but it, to me it was definitely noticeable the, the the takeaway is just that that certainly the ultraviolet light on top of producing vitamin d which is very important to the body for a variety of different reasons from the fact that it boosts your immune system, we can get into the health effects. It's doing two things. The ultraviolet light, while it's, it's satiating some of the, the opioid receptors in your brain at, at, a, at a healthy level, it, Dr. Fisher, you're welcome to look into the research papers and we can show them to your audience at some point. Vitamin D also mediates the, the body's response to opioids. So when they went and looked at outpatient operations, people that had, let's say, tonsillectomy or gallbladder removal or something that wasn't too serious, they had to go in, painful, here is a prescription or a, a painkiller prescription, take it. And then they would follow up and see of the people that continued to use painkillers after, long after they should have probably stopped from the operation, what were their vitamin D levels prior to entering that operation? And like, what are they now? And they noticed that people that had low vitamin D levels, therefore weren't exposed to the sun, were much more likely to continue using those prescription mm -hmm. opioids longer than the people that had adequate vitamin D levels to begin with. And so there's a lot of evidence pointing to the, to the idea that in climates, particularly with our lifestyles where we're, if you work in the Midwest or the Northeast, the Pacific Northwest, where it's kind of gloomy half the year, and we're in our cars, we're driving to work, we're sitting at the computer, we're not getting exposed to the sun, we're not getting enough vitamin D, we're not getting the UV to kind of sati satiate the, the opioid levels, that all it requires is, is a little taste of that, that synthetic opioid, and suddenly our brain already starved of it because we don't have enough vitamin D or UV light, Ooh, it, our brains respond really well to it, and suddenly we become very dependent or addictive to it. Mm. It's just so fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, this is so important um for anybody who's watching or listening who knows somebody who's addicted to a painkiller to op opioids right now 
because potentially, and of course, work with a practitioner and do your own research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but potentially, there's a strong argument that you know, getting somebody who's addicted to painkillers and opioids, getting them out in the sun, yes, getting their vitamin D levels up, could make it easier for them to wean off. Yes, to mitigate especially some of the symptoms as well. Hundred percent, Ben. So, in talking with the, the few researchers that have been looking at this. There's, kind of, there's two approaches to go about it. There's one, making sure that you're getting enough sunlight, mm-hmm. vitamin D, just baseline throughout your life. So you're less likely, your, your brain's less likely to respond to prescription painkillers if you need them in an addictive way. The second half on the flip side is people that are already abusing or dependent on opioids rather than a kind of medieval old fashioned way that we have at the moment of methadone clinics where we Mm -hmm. kind of put them on maintenance and we try to well we're going to shuffle you from heroin or fentanyl we're going to put you on a methadone clinic and you're going to go each day to the methadone clinic and then we're going to slowly try to taper your dose down on on methadone the evidence points to you could do the same thing with ultraviolet light you could substitute out methadone for ultraviolet light since they're they're both satiating the the opioid receptors and use ultraviolet light is a way to titrate somebody that's opioid dependent down on a lower and lower and lower and lower doses and eventually get them off it. So tanning beds could do that too. Right. And th- this is th- this is the dual edged sword of tanning beds. So I I'm happy to admit or, or willing to admit I for a long time laughed at the idea of this kind of like tanning bed addiction. Oh, you know, <laughs> yeah, these right. people are just vain, Same. you know. Yeah. They, 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 maybe body dysmorphia, whatever's going on. They just, you know, they just, I, I didn't believe it. I just thought, whatever. No, I, the evidence is pretty clear at this point, I believe. And I think you can find pretty compelling evidence by pretty esteemed researchers at the tops of their fields that tanning beds, because they are just very potent UVA light, they are just as addictive as, as Vicodin or oxycodone or, or heroin or any other opioid. And so it, it can go both ways. You can get addicted to tanning beds, mm-hmm. but you can also use a tanning bed as, as a tool to get someone off synthetic opioids. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of fleshing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code bond charge hooked you up so head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your bond charge products all right let's get back to today's video 
How, how, what have you seen, what, what kind of outpouring have you seen on your, your, your YouTube videos regarding this and your social media content? What are some, maybe some comments or some stories people have shared about, you know, once they discovered your, your video about this, what are some things that you've seen? I think people have had a variety of responses to it. The, the biggest one to my mind is it articulated, hopefully, or some people have said it articulated something that they felt but weren't, weren't sure about, which is they, they lived in Ohio and in Columbus and it was gloomy all the time. Or they, you know, they're around Portland, Oregon, and they ended up knowing a lot of people that got addicted to opioids. And it didn't seem like anybody in Arizona is really addicted to opioids the way you kind of see ravaging the Midwest or Portland, Oregon. And the fact that it's much gloomier and the, the sunlight effect has such a, a big difference on, on people's predisposition to getting addicted, or they themselves were getting addicted, or found that their mood or happiness was much better when they were getting chronic sunlight. They felt vindicated, like, oh, maybe my lifestyle, or those lifestyles of the people living in, in Detroit or Indianapolis, you know, where it was quite gloomy. It was like, oh, maybe, maybe there's... Uh, a variety of variables here that are that are going on that are contributing to the kind of opioid crisis we're seeing in the U.S. Outside of Mexico and China, are just shipping a bunch of fentanyl, yeah. and people are idiots and getting addicted. There's a variety of biological and environmental factors that are taking place, both climactically and our lifestyle, that are that are leading to people getting hooked on these things that you know are, are fine, normal, like smart people. And and wind up in a bad situation. What happens when you wear sunblock all the time and sunglasses? Are you still getting the benefits? So sunblock is a, a kind of a controversial subject. This is where perhaps some of the doctors and I would spar. A lot of the doctors are dermatologists by training that were doing the research. And dermatology is a big focus because I see a lot of it is is skin cancer. And yeah. skin cancer is a, is a serious thing, and skin cancer is caused by overexposure to the sun, specifically ultraviolet radiation, causes a lot of skin cancer. And in the, the sunblocks, the kind of Dr. Fisher, who in the video I, I speak to, is the one who really did the research on mice and kind of proved the, the direct link between ultraviolet light and opioid receptors. He, he very much was of the mind that, well, let's still avoid UV light because it can cause skin cancer. Take a vitamin D supplement. Take a vitamin D supplement. I myself might be a more a little loosey-goosey. You know, I think it's good to get outside, good to get the sun. It just encourages a more active lifestyle. The, the sunblocks are, are, are tricky because a lot of the sunblocks when you dig down into their active ingredients, they tend to block, again, if I'm getting too into the weeds, stop me. So there's ultraviolet A and mm -hmm. ultraviolet B, and they're two different wavelengths, and they do slightly different things. UVB is the one that's, that's responsible for your body producing vitamin D, and also sun burns. UVA is responsible for sun tans. The sunblock manufacturers have recognized that people want to put on sunblock and, you know, not get sunburned because it's uncomfortable, but they also want to get suntan as well. So a lot of the suntan lotions or blocks you put on, they're kind of harmful in the sense that you put them on and you go to the beach and you think, oh, terrific, I didn't get burned and somehow I'm still tan. Well, they're actually blocking the UVB part of it, which is blocking you from getting burned. But it's also blocking your vitamin D ability, your body's ability to synthesize vitamin D because it's blocking UVB in particular, but allowing UVA light. So I'm not a huge proponent of sunblocks just because I think a lot of the marketing behind it's not very honest. Mm -hmm. And often it's blocking vitamin D synthesis, which I think is very important. And people just don't take vitamin D supplements. They're not, not on their mind. They think, oh, I'll go outside, maybe I'll put on some sunblock. It'll be good for me. I'm going to get my vitamin D. And you're actually not getting your vitamin D. Yeah. That sunblock is blocking your vitamin D synthesis. So unless you really dig into the various manufacturers and 
what combination they're using to block the sun. I, you know, I, I withhold, I would say do your own research. It's kind of a complicated subject. It's important. Yeah. It's important. I look, I'm against, you know, for the most part, using sunscreen, using sunblock. Yeah. That's one reason why. Another reason why is because typically it's loaded with chemicals and right. that's going into your bloodstream, going into your body. But you know, even if you're gonna do sunscreen, if you know you're gonna be outside for a long period of time, you're gonna you're here in Miami, you're gonna be out yeah. between like eleven AM and three PM, you're on a boat, whatever it is. I have found different ways other than sunscreen that I'll share with my audience that actually prevent you from burning. You could actually this might sound weird, but you could actually put beef beef tallow or even lard on your okay. face or the areas you want to prevent burning. Yeah. And it prevents you from actually burning. It actually gets you a nice tan. So okay, lard or beef towel, putting fat from animals on your face, but not everybody wants to do that. Something else you can do, I have found anecdotally that individuals who consume a lot of uh, polyunsaturated fats, so these are like vegetable oils and seed okay. oils, these are, these are fats that have been adultered and made in a factory, right? Yeah. So like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, they'll extract uh, from these vegetables the oil and they'll process it at high temperatures and chemical detergents and a lot of people cook with them and fry, a lot of fried foods with that. I have found that people who consume a lot of vegetable oils burn easier. And I think okay. the reason why is because the linoleic acid, which is the fat in these vegetable oils, has a half-life in the body about 680 days, okay, which is a very long time. So, yeah. um, and those who take a lot of fish oil, I also have seen burn easily too. Hmm. Okay. With research, because that's anecdotal, but with research, there's a lot of research showing that astaxanthin, which is the antioxidant that gives salmon that orange color sure okay yeah krill that red color astaxanthin is kind of like internal sunscreen where if you take three milligrams up to 10 milligrams on a day you're going to be exposed to a lot of sunshine it prevents the skin burning and you get the benefits of uva and uvb and the opioid mm -hmm. and all that stuff so taking astaxanthin not from fish oil but from an algae also could help from from skin burning from sun burning so i would go that route instead of putting a whole bunch of toxic sunscreen on your body or sunblock That's on your right. body uh if you're gonna just do sunblock you know just simple zinc oxide could do the trick and, and yeah. you know without the chemicals but i wanted to just add my part there because i've done a lot yeah. of research here no i think it's totally fair sunblock people have very strong opinions on sunblock that run the continuum and I would say, you know, kind of take what you say, figure out what works for you. Also, your your skin type. There's a, something called the Fitzpatrick scale, which means, you know, if you're pretty pale, you're from Ireland, you're much more likely to burn much easier than just based on the melanin, the natural melanin amount in your skin. So different people are going to require different levels of sunblock just on how rapidly they're likely to sunburn, you know. I, yeah. I, I want to just, just emphasize that I am not a doctor, and every every doctor I have spoken to has been very adamant that they they do not like skin cancers, and they're big believers in like, oh, we need to cut down on melanomas. You know, they they like sunblock. So I don't want to ignore all the the. <laughs> that, I want to at least do them justice. Yeah. Yes, yes. I've been told that's fair. Yeah. You know, and then the argument to that would be okay, but skin melanoma, skin cancer is is a. Um, a result of something and they would say yeah it's a result of getting too much sun yeah. and getting burned but i would ask the question why are we getting burned right i don't think it's because of the sun exposure necessarily it goes back to what i just shared i think it's because of our nutrition we're yeah. eating bad fats that are becoming uh, a part of ourselves our cell sure. makeup that are easily oxidized and in fish oil etc because uh, for example me Although I'm from the Middle East, my parents are from Iran. I actually, oh, okay. actually, yeah, they actually immigrated. Persian. I'm, yeah, Persian, I'm first yeah, generation nice. American. And when I was younger, eating vegetable oils, eating fried food, eating Kentucky yeah. Fried Chicken, where my mom used to work, actually, I burned really easily. Okay. When I stopped eating fried food and I got rid of vegetable oils, I could go out in the sun for five hours and I'll get a nice tan. I won't get burned, right? <laughs> so it's like even me, you know, I noticed that, but I also noticed that with a lot of students. Anyways, the point is. Uh, dermatologists are always going to say, right, be I, careful. I, I, so. <laughs> and there is a point to that. Skin cancer is the number one cancer out there. Yeah. It's very common, but you know, let's see, let's, you know, research both parts to my audience. Right. Uh, yeah. I basically a hundred percent agree with you on, you know, each person has got to make the best decision for themselves at the end of the day and, and balance the, the real and long-term risks uh, of skin cancers, which are, 
number one cancer, but also the real evidence-based facts that vitamin D and sunlight and ultraviolet light and just like sunlight exposure for sad are all, all important factors, you know, that you want to consider when trying to live a life that's, that's meaningful or, <laughs> or making you yeah. happy. Move to Florida. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Sunshine State you even you even had in your video, like go to Miami, yeah. uh, which you're at right now. Yes. What is your goal with this? You know, this documentary. I know you have the hypothesis. You experimented. Like, what is your goal? Like, for those listening and watching, like, what can we do to support this? This these findings that you that you found out here. I don't know. They had a, a grandiose goal. It was, it was a topic that fascinated me. One because I couldn't find out much about it that was partly due to the fact that i just happened to be catching these research papers as they were being published you know the research was being done 2020 2021 2022 they're still working on it as yeah. we speak new research is coming out about vitamin d ultraviolet light and its effects with opioids this kind of trifecta combination is still being researched and looked at as we speak and there'll be more research i'm sure in for the next decade two decades as we get to understand in a more nuanced view, how these all affect the humans, humans' interactions with, with, with drugs and sunlight and vitamin D. The, the goal was for my own personal understanding of, of the kind of just observations I've seen of, of areas that seem to be hit harder by the opioid crisis and why certain people get addicted to things, why other people don't, what's behind kind of the, the lifestyle of, of being in the sun. And I would just encourage people to, to get outside and get sunlight. You know, it, I, I did not appreciate until after kind of going down and doing this project and speaking to these doctors and these researchers, how important it is, even when it's cold, if it's sunny outside, go out, get a walk, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 50 minutes, doesn't matter. Expose your body to a little bit of sunlight, hopefully a little bit of vitamin D synthesis or start taking vitamin D. It helps your immune system, among other things, but it'll also protect you <laughs> against perhaps becoming opioid dependent if you find yourself in a surgery or in a bad accident and suddenly you're having to take a painkiller. And if your body's desperately craving that, that little opioid satiation, if you're already taking vitamin D and getting natural exposure to ultraviolet light, you're much less likely to become hooked on opioids. You're just much less likely to become hooked on opioids. Did you test your vitamin D levels before and after your experiment? Yes. My vitamin D levels were, were actually pretty good before and because I just take vitamin D. I had heard, oh, it's good for your immune system, et cetera. So I had, incidentally, I've been taking vitamin D supplements to begin with. My, my vitamin D levels raised somewhat, but they were already at a healthy baseline just because of... Just Do you remember what the levels were? Oh, no. Because the reason I asked... I don't want to give the wrong answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. fine. <laughs> so, you know, the reason I asked is because on the, on the standard reference range yeah. on that lab report, the ranges are uh, between 30 and 100. Yeah. But I would argue that if you're 32, 35, even below 40, it's deficient in my book. Oh, that's... Yeah, I shouldn't... Like, the again, the stats on vitamin D deficiency are... It's just mind blowing how many Americans are vitamin D deficient. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. Again, when you start digging into huge, most people's blood work, they're vitamin D deficient all over this country. And the issue is that yeah. if they if they get a thirty two on that lab report for vitamin D, most conventional doctors would actually be like, "Oh, you're on the low end, but you're not deficient, right?" But thirty two is the deficiency. Yeah, or at very least insufficient. Yeah, like, it's like, it's insufficient. Yeah. yeah, and I was telling you offline, but I think it's important to share this with my audience. When you have high levels of insulin production from high carbs and, yeah. and high processed carbohydrates and you're eating frequently, that does block down, uh, block nitric, uh, not nitric, but vitamin D production in the mm -hmm. body. So a lot of people who are insulin resistant and type 2 diabetic, which is, by the way, 60% uh, of Americans are adults are yeah. diabetic or pre-diabetic. They could take all the vitamin D supplementation in the world or even get outside. It might budge a little, but it's not going to get you into an optimal state until you lower the insulin, the insulin levels. So there's a lot of moving parts here, right? So um, vitamin D is important. Right. I, I, I get mine tested frequently. I, I like to stay over 50 personally, yeah. sometimes over 60. I've never seen anything in literature that shows there's a vitamin D toxicity level. 
No. Although I wouldn't want to get it over 100 just because it just it sounds crazy to bring my vitamin D levels over 100, but I've never seen anything that shows a toxicity level. On the topic, though, of vitamin D supplementation, yes, there's a an issue, I should say, or a, a challenge with taking vitamin D only mm -hmm. long-term without the other fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K together. Right. Because vitamin D and all the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, they all compete for the same receptor sites on our cells that pick yeah. up the message. So what ends up happening, if you take vitamin D alone without the other fat-soluble vitamins for a long period of time, it creates an insufficiency, a deficiency in the other fat-soluble right. vitamins. So that's why it's important to get the sun because you don't have to worry about that. Right. The sun is the best way to do it. Right. No, the, the biological adaptation... There's a reason why, like it, it kind of prehistoric. Again, this is this is somewhat speculatory, but the evidence points that like the body developed in a in a very important way to go out into the sun, even when it's cold, even if you're an Inuit or wherever you were, to go out and get in the sun to get that vitamin D synthesis because vitamin D deficiency or in, insufficiency just leads to endless health problems. And so getting a little bit of sunlight to get vitamin D synthesis is super important for the body. And, and it seems ev evolutionarily built that way. Just the way the the such the reward system built into our brain to get sunlight that's, that's causing an opioid response is so strong. Like that's such a, a weird way to develop, you know, well, UV light is tied to our opioid yeah, receptors. Wow. You know, it, well, <laughs> biologically, that's because it was so important it, to the... the the success of our species to get sunlight, to get vitamin D that, you know, oh, well, we'll tie it to our opioid receptors if we need to. The body's like, you know, get, we, humans need sunlight. We need vitamin D. This is critical. Did you hear that, uh, Bill? And this is not conspiracy. This is, I, I, I fact checked this, but Bill, <laughs> Bill Gates is um, global warming, right? Bill okay. Gates is trying to do something about global warming. So one of his ideas is that we need to cool down the sun you okay. can't you can't cool down the sun. So what do you do? You you create some sort of shield to make it as uh, to kind of block it to block the sun. Okay. So he's working on um, some sort of technology that kind of shield blocks the sun, the UVA UVB rays from the sun to help with to help cool the planet. Okay. I know you're just hearing this probably. So uh, any initial thoughts about that? <laughs> My initial thoughts are. <laughs> People that are hyper successful in one area tend to believe they'll be hyper successful in all areas. And I'm not, you know, I'm a little suspicious if their genius really extends to all facets of life. So, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm highly suspicious. I, if, if, that, if that makes sense, I, you know, okay, Bill Gates, you know, he has a lot of money. It doesn't seem like to me a, com a compelling reason to blot out the sun to reduce glow, you know, okay. Okay, yeah. Bill Gates. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. you know, I agree with you. I think it's uh, highly suspicious. Yeah. I remember he was on the news talking about COVID and, you know, vaccines. But I was like, why is Bill Gates talking about this? It was just interesting to me when I saw him on the news stations. Well, I mean, he's either in the news for that or taking planes with Epstein. So, you know, he's, <laughs> yeah. got, he's got to redirect, you know, <laughs> the, the narrative somewhere, I suppose. So let's, let's, uh, let's, cir let's uh, circle to a different topic because I know some people get triggered when we start talking oh, about yes. things like sorry, that. Sorry, no, sorry, no, sorry. no. I'm the one who brought it up. Okay. If you're following a low carbohydrate keto diet or carnivore diet, this is one of the most important tips. I see a lot of people who struggle with keto and carnivore and the reason they struggle is because they are losing too many electrolytes. They're becoming mineral depleted. Every cell in your body needs minerals to function, to produce energy, which helps you burn fat and feel good. My favorite minerals and electrolytes are from Beam Minerals. These are fulvic and humic compounds that are bioavailable, that help have over 70 minerals in them. It tastes like water. And all you do is simply drink from the bottle every single day to replenish your electrolytes. They also have sprays that you could put directly on a muscle cramp, a foot cramp, and it alleviates the cramping. And this is what I take with me to go, which is a mineral complex that I could travel with. And it's been shown that when you take the right minerals and electrolytes, you're going to support your immune system, 
lower inflammation, help detoxify the body. These are plant-based, but they're carnivore friendly. Let me explain why. There are no anti-nutrients in them. It does not break a fast. As a matter of fact, it could support your fasting window. And it's been a game changer for my health and I recommend it to all my students. So if you wanna get your hands on some bean minerals, head over to beanminerals.com. Use the coupon code AZADI at checkout, my last name, A-Z-A-D-I at checkout to get a nice discount. Beanminerals.com, coupon code is AZADI. We have something in common, which is uh, dairy. Uh, Adam put it on my radar okay. that we both did some research on dairy. You know, some of the, one of the big things people do when they do a keto diet is they eat a lot of cheese and dairy. Okay, yeah. And I discovered, and I, I, I found out through Ada that you found the same thing, that um, about 75% of the adult population in the world is actually lactose intolerant. Like, yes. Yeah, 75%. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge percentage. It blew my mind yeah. when I never thought anything of it growing up. You know, I just drank my milk. And then, you know, I would hear in class, oh, this one student's lactose intolerant. I grew mm -hmm. up in the Midwest, the most like white, vanilla. Kansas. Yeah, Kansas, just your standard corn-fed Midwest Germanic, you know. People just drank milk, you know, you got milk, the ads everywhere I remember growing up. And then somewhere along the line, I think I was speaking to a Korean friend or somebody said, yeah, you know, I'm lactose intolerant. Everybody I'm from is lactose intolerant. I was like, I mean, everybody's lactose intolerant in Korea. Yeah. And then I looked it up. Oh, most Asians are lactose intolerant. And it turns out most people in the world are lactose intolerant. In the world. Yeah. 75%. Yeah. As adults, because we end up losing our ability. As kids, we could. Yes, correct. And then as we grow up, we end up losing the ability, which makes sense. You know, as a kid, you want to actually be growing and getting milk. Yes. But as an adult, you don't really need to grow anymore. No. So <laughs> there's no need for it. Now, that is as it relates to pasteurized cow dairy. Raw dairy could be different. Okay. Um, that study was done on pasteurized. So raw would be different. I don't know what the percentage would be, but raw. But either way, I always tell my students. Hey, go with sheep and, and uh, goat dairy instead. It's much uh, more safer than okay, pasteurized cow dairy. Okay, interesting. It's processed a lot easier. So I usually do I usually do sheep and goat because uh, I know I'm one of the 75%. I tested my genetics and it showed that. Sheep and goat. What about almond milk? I imagine that's because it's coming from... The issue with almond milk is that almonds have high amounts of something called oxalates. Okay. Oxalates are these tiny little crystals found in plants and okay. nuts and seeds, and uh, it creates kidney stones, and they also, oxalates end kidney up... Kidney stones, yikes. Yeah, I know, and they end up um, in your joints, and they end up inflaming your gut. So I'm not a big fan of almonds in general because of the oxalate okay. uh, count. Uh, you could also find high oxalates in spinach and kale too. So okay. I would stay away from almond milk, but if you're going to do like a milk, then macadamia nut milk or coconut milk is a good option. Yeah, okay. those would be better than almond or, or cow milk. But would you suggest people, even as adults, drink milk? Like, do you think it's necessary? Or could they just get away with, with skating without it? Like cow milk or any milk in Just general? any milk. Just say forget it entirely. I mean, you don't need to. But a lot of people like to do protein shakes. And That's fair. They like to put things in their coffee. Um, true. People do like to yeah, have their so, coffee. Yeah, yeah. So I heavy, just drink it black, so it doesn't even. Occur oh, to you're me. one of those. Yeah, huh? I'm just, yeah, you're just a psychopath with coffee. You're yeah. like, I, you know, I wish I, I enjoyed mine black. Uh, heavy cream is okay because it's mostly fat. It's mostly milk fat versus milk okay. protein. But I wouldn't put milk in my coffee, like cow milk or anything like that. Okay. So heavy cream is better. Um, you could put butter and ghee. Ghee is actually better because it removes the the lactose altogether. Different things you can do. Uh, but yeah, that's it's just interesting because most people don't know that 75%. They're, yeah. You know, if 100 people are listening at this moment, 75 of you are lactose intolerant. Yeah. It's it's an interesting form of kind of latent American assumption or, or bias, just the, the idea of mil cow milk is totally fine. Everybody can drink it. Like, you know, what are you talking about? It's like, well, actually... Unless you're Eastern, Western European from the kind of general Central European Asia area, no. You're right, <laughs> you're, exactly. you're like doesn't tolerant. <laughs> so let's uh, land the plane here, Alec. Okay. I'm just reading some quotes that Ada gave me. Okay. I'm going to read these worthy, she says worthy quotes. Worthy quotes. I used to be really dismissive of tanning addiction until it was a real thing. You just said that. Yes. The sun is an ancient opiate. Yes. Mm. Again, I mean, it just gets back to the idea that before we got clever enough to figure out how to kind of harvest the 
poppy plant, which we got pretty clever pretty early on, oh, <laughs> on, for on, how sure. to, on how to make morphine and all types of concoctions. But all the way before we, we figured out how to concoct opium or opioids or anything, we were getting a dose of, of an, an opioid in our brain through the sunlight. It's kind of the original, original taste of opioids was the sun. And, and again, speculation, you, you could argue that the way our, our brain developed to tie the opioid receptors t- to the sun is in, in some ways the cause of a lot of opioid addictions because it's just so important that that it's the the entire species is willing to risk a f- portion or a fraction of people getting addicted to opioids so that at least enough humans get vitamin D synthesis to carry the species forward so cool right the sun is the source man yeah it really is and if you're thinking about that term i have it here the heliophilia addiction to the sun addiction to sun tanning and sun uh tanning salons etc i used to think it was bogus but now i am convinced it is a real thing yeah just to add to the in the sun the sun tanning beds they're actually quite clever in the way they market and maybe they do it without realizing it <laughs> but if you most sun tanning bed operations they'll kind of offer you know the first three are free mm right it's very oh. smart oh okay well the first you know first couple are free it's why like, not i feel so good and every then you, time i then go then you get you oh i feel pretty good i have a tan i look good and also like my body kind of likes it, it maybe subconsciously but it's it's an addiction and suddenly you're hooked right back in you're paying the membership and 10 years later you know you're just tanned to the gills and some people are able to 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 navigate it fine again everybody's different some people won't get addicted to things from my observation other people will but if you're predisposed to it the tanning bed can be just as addictive as you have a surgery you take some vicodin and then yeah you stay six on months it. later you're seer are you still doing tanning beds no yeah. i cut myself off okay yeah was it was it tough i'm trying to reflect back on it yeah it was the like, did you, what, what was tough about it? Did you just like have the urge? I got to go get to my, go to the tanning bed or was there actual like physical things? No, you were it was, I think it was more psychological than physiological, okay. but it was certainly, if I go without coffee for like a day or two, I'm kind of just like unpleasant to be around and I, you know, I want coffee. I found I had done this experiment during the summer where there was ample sunlight in New York City. And then I was tanning on top of it. And as the fall turned into the winter and the sun and the cloud, it's like 50%, 45% rate of sunniness in the winter. It's pretty gloomy, overcast in New York City. And my body started to, it was used to a certain level of just ultraviolet light. Getting It was used to that, that, that level. And for the first couple of weeks, yeah, my mind was like, oh, you know what would feel better? If you just went to the tanning salon, you would feel better. You would be happier. And I just said, well, no, I got to ignore it. It's like, it was, a, I could feel the compulsion. Yeah. Is really what, it, that's probably the best word. It was, like, it was a compulsion that was just back of my brain that I felt kind of low and, and I don't want to use depression because people have different interpretations of depression, but kind of a low level just gloom Mm -hmm. and with a compulsion to to seek out you know like basically textbook like drug seeking behavior right i had a a a a tanning bed seeking behavior that i could detect in myself so interesting that eventually went away but certainly yes it it was there and i I had forgotten about this entirely because i did this two years ago Mm -hmm. or something but but now that you bring it up yes that's fascinating Uh, we're gonna put the, we have some research, research studies that you referenced. We're going to put that in the notes, uh, the YouTube channel, the podcast to go check out. If you want to check out the research, I recommend you do. I'm also going to put your video, uh, okay. uh, the documentary you did. Yeah. It's about 30 minutes. It's fantastic. The editing is great. Uh, you spent a lot of time on this. Everybody go watch that. We'll reference that down below in the notes. 
Anywhere else you want your YouTube channel is Boss Wiki. Yep. Subscribe to it. B-O-S-T-W-I-K-I. Uh, we'll put that down below. Anywhere else you want the audience to go check you out? Hey, you just Google Boss Wiki. If you like my videos on TikTok or you know, whatever I have to say on Twitter, which is nothing that important. Yeah, just mm -hmm. YouTube. Twitter X. Yeah. X, X, yeah. X, you know, whatever. <laughs> I have a final, a final question yeah. for you. I asked all my guests this okay. question, at least the last 300 guests I started doing this. Hey, I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone? Well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded Tea. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded Tea is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded tea is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's gonna increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last five to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one, take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, head over to upgradedformulas.com. And if you use the coupon code ketosis at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com, ketosis at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below and let's get back to today's video. I talk a lot about a, a supplement that also uh, is anti-inflammatory, like vitamin D. Uh, okay. It helps with inflammation, as I just mentioned. It helps with just feeling better. It could help with oxytocin, GABA. It could help regulate the immune system. Uh, it's called vitamin G. Vitamin G, okay. And I call it vitamin G because it's actually experiencing gratitude. It's vitamin gratitude. Okay. So, you know, my shirt actually shows it here. Vitamin oh, D. Look at that. <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> so non-observable. No, I, mean, I didn't expect you to see that. Yeah. No, I just, I just remember that I'm wearing the shirt. So my question for you okay. is... Okay, yes, now that you have my... Yeah, now that, <laughs> what are you grateful for, my friend? What is your vitamin G today, Alec? Oh, what am I grateful for? I'm grateful that I live in the United States where we have places like Miami, where I can just bounce from New York City to go get some sunlight or go to the beach. That's, I mean, the top of mind is, <laughs> is I'm grateful that we live in a, in a vast, diverse country where one, there are people doing like, despite the cynicism on the internet, I can't even say the word, despite the cynicism on the internet, there are a ton of smart people doing smart research. <laughs> you may not know about it, but it's out there. People are publishing it. They're taking things seriously. People are always trying to move the ball forward on science and it's coming out of the U.S. There's a lot of great stuff coming out of the U.S. I'm grateful that research still gets done. Grateful that I'm able to try things and that people are willing to have discussions and that people are open-minded. Doctors took my calls. They were willing to discuss with me. I'm not you know, I'm trained in medicine or anything. Grateful that you found it interesting, that anybody found it interesting. Grateful for the kind of American culture. Amen to that. Greatest yeah. country in the world. What's the next project? <laughs> Oh man, I don't know. I'm I'm terrible about about any sort of thematic underpinning to my. It'll come to you to my my subject matter. I I don't know what this next subject is, Ben. Hopefully, it'll be interesting. 
but we'll see. I trust it. Well, we'll stay tuned. Whatever it is, we'll uh, bring Alec back. I mean, it's not hard to get people to come to Miami. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, thanks for making the trip from New York. I uh, appreciate you. Of course. Everybody go check out Alec's work, his YouTube channel. I would start with that documentary he did. We'll put it down below. And stay tuned for round two when we figure out what's his next project. So thanks, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me.